John Polk Avenue Road. And I'm Sean Duggan. Video JP, I was thinking the other day about uh, teaching the digital tools and processes to people that oftentimes you, know, you can have somebody sit down at a computer and you can give them a tutorial exercise, it's a step-by-step -step exercise with an image that you provide, and they'll get the steps, they get it down, they can do it over and over again, and they've got it. And it you know, it's an exercise that shows certain fundamental concepts. But a lot of times, I think one of the blocks that people experience is they, they sit down at their computer with their own image that they've not done the step-by-step -step on. And you know, they sit there and they, oh, they freeze. I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And you know, it's the same concepts that were presented in the exercise, but of course it's a different image. And so there's that, that little bit of a gap of translating the concepts that were presented on one image to their own image or, or any image. Absolutely. And so one of the things that, that I found is that I needed to communicate my own process to people when I was teaching. And I realized that I never really examined my own process. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I just sort of would sit down with my images and I knew what to do with them. And so I examined my own process and tried to figure out, well, how do I know what to do with them? You know, how am I making these decisions? And it was you know, by this, this uh, journey of looking at my own processes that I realized that uh, in a grand scheme, most of what we do to a photograph when we're editing it, no matter what software we use, can be really distilled down to a few core concepts. We lighten it, we darken it, increase contrast, decrease contrast, uh, play with the color balance, you know, maybe make it warmer or cooler. Again, these are just speaking in broad strokes. Yeah. And work with color saturation. Right. Right. There's really only three elements of color. Yes. Luminosity, hue, and saturation. Exactly. And we're photographers, we work with light. Any visual experience is an experience with light, so you really can knock it down to those three elements. Sure. And what do you do with them? Yeah. Scale. I also find a lot of people use the word contrast mm -hmm. exclusively for light and dark. Right. And it's really interesting to think about the contrast of hue, sure. contrast of warmth. Exactly, yeah. Contrast of saturation. How, how colors contrast with each other. Yeah. Yeah. And so I find that, that, and you probably found this too, is that when you boil it down just to more simple concepts like that, and, and terms that people are just used to thinking of, such as you know, warmer, cooler, lighter, darker, whatever, it makes the editing process much more approachable for people. Absolutely. Because it, it, it makes it not seem so huge, it strips the often confusing software interface out of the way, and it just boils down to these simple concepts of lighter or darker. Right. Well, I think of them as mind tools. Right. And I think often simplicity is highly over underrated. Sure, yeah. Um, I think there's one thing to be simplistic and not really understand things beyond the surface, mm -hmm. and it's another thing to be able to put things across as simply as possible and have a really loaded concept in a tight little bundle. Sure. And, uh, Einstein said, make things as simple as possible, but mm -hmm. not simpler. Right. Yeah. And so, it actually is a very sophisticated concept if you just come after, you have three elements of color and the contrast within them. Right. That's, that's actually a really loaded tool that can be repurposed in a lot of ways, but it's easy to remember. Yeah, and it's a very powerful tool too. Yeah. A very powerful concept for, for uh, you know, how you can look at the image and, and see it in a little bit in a way that is not as as complex as digital software often renders things. Right. Because I think you know the digital tools that we use are wonderful and they give us this great control over editing our images, but oftentimes, you know, until you learn them well and understand them, they can be more of an obstacle right. than you know a helper. And in many cases, you have too many options. Thirty-two yes. color adjustment tools in Photoshop. Well, all affecting use. the same three elements. Right. So if you just looked at those three elements and said, which tool gives me the most precise control of each element, mm -hmm. and which gives me maybe a redundant use, I think you could knock 30% of the tools just right out of your toolkit. Oh, certainly. Because they don't do it as well as just a few simple tools. Few tools, yeah. And then there's often that, that uh, you know, quandary that uh, a new user might experience. Well, which tool do I use? Do I use levels? Do I use curves? Do I use this slider or that slider? Right. And then another thing that I tell people, which which helps it, and again, this is all uh, along the same thematic track of simplifying the question, is I say, well, you should examine your image and be honest about describing its qualities in its you know beginning state. Describe you know whether you feel it should be brighter or darker or you know, what the color should be. Examine maybe what your 
intent for the images, what you were hoping to capture when you photographed it. And as you do that, you'll start to pick out certain terms that are going to begin to provide a little roadmap for you for how you might apply those corrections. Right. Like, oh, I need to make it darker or lighter. And I also like to, for myself anyway, I like to divide the image up into the different sections of the scene. Mm. The sky, the far landscape, the near landscape, the water, whatever. And that also helps me start to conceptualize, well, how might I adjust these areas differently? You know, if I did that, is that going to change the balance of the picture? Is it going to provide a different path for the viewer's eye right. as it goes to the picture? And so the viewer's eye makes a dream. I often think of it as a story. Sure. Uh, I think you and I both use the notion of the picture frame as being a stage mm -hmm. on which there's a primary actor. Yeah. Often there's a secondary actor. And hopefully there's a story. I always get after my students for doing pictures that just vogue. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty object just sitting there right. with no relationship to the rest of the environment that it's in and without some other actor on the stage, be it a, uh, an equally important actor or a very small actor that gives it some kind of counterpoint or some kind of relationship, that main actor needs to be doing something, otherwise there's no verb. Yes, exactly. Voguing is just hanging out there, just yeah. sitting there on the stage. Aren't I pretty? Yeah. Yes, you are pretty, but at a certain point. Yeah. Unless you're Weston's Pepper, where this Pepper uh, it reminds us of so many other things. Yeah, it's, it's almost going through that's an on a different level there, Weston's Pepper. Right. And it's a very interesting to ask why does that one image, which is a simple object on a simple background, take on all of those other levels? For me, I think it's the power of metaphor, mm -hmm. perhaps gesture, but I always think of those as nudes, even though Weston never really related oh, to Oh, yeah, it's only with Pepper you can see that. Yeah. My well, dad's Galaxy yeah. Apple. Oh, yeah. It's a I, simple apple, but most I, people look at it. That was one of my favorite pictures that I saw in, yeah. in the show the other day. Yeah, mine too. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. So it's one thing is suggesting another, and there's a kind of a communion or a, a right. powerful sense of metaphor. Yeah. But in most cases, I think that something needs to be going on in the image. And if you can identify what the main story arc is, yeah. and then decide what the sub-themes are, because sometimes the sub-themes are so strong that it creates a tension and there's no hierarchy within the image. Right. And to know what to focus on and how to get there. Yeah. Then you can start to use all of those color tools we were talking about, enhance light in a way that enhances the quality of that journey. Right. It tells us more about what the experience of, of going through that process or going through that action is like and enhance yeah, exactly. the core message. But first, you have to identify what the message of the image is. Yeah, and I like to think of myself, you know, because I had, uh, in my younger days, I did a lot of stage work, uh, both, you know, backstage and on stage performing. And so I, you know, get, getting at that stage metaphor, I like to, to think of, of the, the scene I'm photographing as a stage yeah. and, and the finished photograph that I come back with, or at least the captured photograph as a stage. And I put myself in the imaginary role of lighting director. Yeah. And, and after I identify, you know, my main characters in the, in the in the scene, I figure out, well, how do I want to light them? You know, do I want to put a little bit more light on this actor? They're going to be delivering a little soliloquy here, so I need to give them a little bit of light, dim down the rest of the stage. And and I mean, I find that you know, it's maybe a little bit esoteric to think about it in that terms, but it works for me, and it really does help provide uh, a roadmap or a sense of structure for thinking about the image differently in terms of. Uh, you know, it's a scene of whatever, a landscape in Iceland, Death Valley, a still life, a portrait, but it gives me a, a way to interpret that image differently and it makes it much easier to find my way through it in terms of applying the adjustments. Yeah, I don't think it's esoteric at all. No? No, not at all. In fact, I think we're so used to looking at film these days that uh, we're used to thinking of pictures telling stories. Sure. Rob Stewart says every picture tells a story. Yeah. So I think it's up to us as image creators to figure out what the story is. And this whole notion of storytelling, I find, is useful not only for enhancing things in post, but also for deciding how to frame things, mm -hmm. which shots to select, which two shots to pair together, yeah, which exactly. sequence of Sequencing things. Is important. A lot of times if you don't figure out the story out there, you don't know how to frame it. Mm -hmm. You don't know that you need to get the second shot or the third shot exactly. uh, to flesh out that story. Yeah. So I, I think all of this is visual storytelling. The amazing thing is that there's so many creative possibilities that you can put two people in the same situation with identical tools and they'll come away with different stories. Totally different pictures, yeah. And that's one of the reasons I'm in photography because I just I love seeing how different people relate to it. Right. I, I see their vision and in contrast to my own, 
I learned something not only about the world, I learned mm -hmm. something about the medium, I learned something about somebody else, but I also learned more about myself because I made something that was different. I made different choices. You know, I, I read a, a little anecdote, uh, I think Seth Resnick posted this, about when you two were in Antarctica, I mean, it was last year, yeah. and you're both at the rail of the boat, uh, the ship, photographing icebergs, and he's, you've got a wide angle lens, and he's got a 400 millimeter or 800 millimeter or something, and you both looked at each other going, what do you see? <laughs> it, it was a real turning point for both of us. Yeah. And on all three trips that we made, we really found the contrast of our visions to be extremely stimulating. Mm -hmm. And we both learned to see in different ways. Yeah. That was on the first trip in 2005. And on the second trip in 2007, we showed up with the opposite lens. Right. I showed up with a 400, 100 to 400. Yeah. He showed up with a, a 28 or something mm -hmm. like that. And uh, on the third trip, we showed up with two cameras and two totally different, one wide, one really long. That way you have on, on uh, one camera yeah. at the same it's time. Play both. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. It was when I was down in Antarctica on that first trip that I really learned to see, not just think about, but see at 300 or 400 millimeters. Yeah, that's you have to get used to that because it's a totally different way of seeing. And you can, you can uh, once you know that, you can then sort of pre-visualize what that scene is going to look like. Yeah, that focal length. Or even recognize the possibilities in front of you. Exactly. Uh, yeah. so right. It's great to be around other people. Oh, so much. Like yeah. Definitely feed off each other that way. For sure. Yeah. Uh, great. Cool. So, I'm John Paul Capenegro. You can find more at my website. And I'm Sean Duggan, and you can find more at my website, which is seanduggan.com.